Hey there, everybody. I thought I'd share a little talk that I put together on a rather intriguing phenomenon that's gotten a lot of attention lately in optics, and that's a phenomenon of what we call super oscillations, which is being used to do imaging beyond the limits of diffraction. In this presentation, I'll try and explain what a super oscillation is and how it's being used to improve imaging. Now, to give a little context here, You've probably seen pictures like the one on the left here a lot. We often visualize light as rays that get bent by lenses and imaging systems. And if you want to model an imaging system with multiple lenses, you can draw the rays through the whole system and see what it does. But the ray picture of light kind of implies that we image light or we focus light to a perfect point. But the wave properties of light result in us never getting an ideal perfect point. And in fact, we get a spread out complicated blob of light, which is still very small, but is of finite size. And that spot size is usually no smaller than one half of the wavelength of light. And this picture, incidentally, which I use as a zoom in, was first done by Linfoot and Wolf. Wolf was my PhD advisor. This was some of his early work done in 1956. And they constructed this diagram theoretically, and it took them weeks to construct it. But the idea is, is that when you focus light, you don't get an ideal point. You get a smeared out blob of light. And that limits how well you can resolve the objects that you're trying to image. And this really comes down to the fact that waves tend to spread out. When a wave propagates, it spreads, and waves are a non-local phenomenon, and usually the smallest spot you can create by focusing or concentrating is about half the wavelength of light. And this puts a fundamental limit on the performance of imaging systems like telescopes. If you're trying to image two point-like objects that are very close together, your image is going to be two blobs of light that are very close together. And when those blobs of light overlap, you can't resolve them anymore or can't tell that there are two blobs. And however, waves can also interfere with each other. They can partially cancel each other out in some regions and enhance each other in others. And by using those interference effects, you can do some clever interference tricks to make spots that are in fact smaller than half the wavelength of light, and these are what we call super oscillations. Well, let me say a little bit about waves before we get into the real details, just for those who are unfamiliar. When you picture a wave, you might picture waves like vibrating on a string or water or waves vibrating on the surface of water. And we usually look at single frequency waves for simplicity. And this is a picture of if you were looking at the amplitude of the wave at a, as a function of time at a single point in space, you would see it wiggling up and down. And the spacing between two peaks is what we call the period of the wave. And that's the inverse of the frequency of the wave. The frequency is how often you see these peaks, how rapidly you see these peaks appear. And the period is the inverse of that. And you can also look at a snapshot in time of the wave in space. And you'll also see in space an up and down of the wave. And the spacing of those peaks in space is what we call the wavelength, which is the inverse of what we call the wave number. Mainly, we tend to think about waves in terms of their frequency in time and their wavelength in space. And wavelength and frequency are, in fact, inversely related. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. And for light, the frequency and the wavelength manifests in the perceived colors of visible light. So red light in the electromagnetic spectrum tends to be around 650 nanometers. Blue light somewhere around 450 nanometers in that range. Though of course, both colors are over a spectrum. And then, of course, there are frequencies and wavelengths we don't see, like gamma rays, x-rays, infrared, and so forth. 
Now, to say a little bit more, to introduce a little bit more about waves, I want to go back into some of the history of it. And the history of that goes back to Thomas Young, who's the person who really cemented the wave theory of light in optics. Thomas Young was a child prodigy born in Somerset, England. He could apparently read at age two, and he'd already read the Bible through twice by age four. By age 14, he could already read Greek and Latin, and he also had an interest in natural philosophy, which we call science these days, and in particular became fascinated by optics at an early age. But he didn't originally go into natural sciences. He went into studying to become a medical doctor, and he began his training in England. He left for Germany for further training in 1795. And as fate would have it, he needed to give a lecture on some sort of medical topic for his degree work in Germany, and he decided to do a lecture on the human voice. So he studied extensively on the human voice, and while he was studying the properties of sound, he became fascinated by the similarities between the properties of sound waves and light, which at that point was thought to be a collection of particles, not a wave. Well, he began working as a doctor in 1799 and apparently failed somewhat miserably. I've read it that he had apparently terrible bedside manner. So he ended up becoming instead a professor of natural philosophy at the Royal Institution in London in 1801. And that freed him up to continue studying the similarities he had seen between light and sound. Well, his first big revelation came from studying the work of Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton, of course, as I've said, was the one who convinced people that light, in fact, consists of a stream of particles. And Newton did a lot of intriguing experiments to argue his case. And one of those experiments are now known as Newton's rings. And what it is, is if you look at light passing through a lens that lies on the surface of a piece of glass, you see reflected light through the lens, and you actually end up seeing colored rings through the lens. Newton tended to explain these rings as a property of the refraction and reflection of light through these curved surfaces. But Young, looking at this, realized that these rings kind of had an analogy to organ pipes. And when you look at sound in an organ pipe, the sound you get out of an organ pipe depends on the length of the pipe because the pipe ends up favoring those waves where a full wavelength or more than one wavelength fits within the pipe. And so if you have a long pipe, a long wavelength sound comes out. If you have a shorter pipe, a shorter wavelength sound comes out. You also have higher harmonics that go into the pipes. So none of the pipes give you a pure tone, but in general, the trend is the longer the pipe, the lower the pitch. And Young realized that the air gap and the thickness of the lens here could very well serve as effectively an organ pipe for light waves. And so the fact that you were seeing different colors had to do with the fact that the light was resonating as a wave in, this re in the region of the lens in the air gap. And you can see almost how this analogy came to Young's mind. If you look at the shape of some organs, some organs are arranged so that the pipes have that sort of curvature to them. So one can almost imagine that Jung saw this as a very visual analogy when he started thinking about organs. So Jung became convinced, contrary to the conventional wisdom at the time, that light, in fact, has wave-like properties. And he gave a lecture on this in 1801, and... It was not very well received because, and didn't get a lot of positive attention because Isaac Newton's particle theory of light had been the norm for a hundred years. So a lot of people 
and Newton was almost a religious figure in science at that point. So a lot of people tended to view Young, Young's ideas as in a hostile sense. And in fact, there were some anonymous articles written about Young that were very rude. This quote below is from one of them. We are sorry to find that Dr. Young is by no means more successful in making observations and experiments than in forming systems. The new case of colors which he affects to have discovered has been observed a thousand times, and he has only the merit of giving an absurd and contradictory explanation of it. Well, it turned out that Young was correct and his critics were wrong, but it would take much more work for Young to prove this conclusively. And though he was discouraged, Young kept working on his ideas involving light and waves. And in 1803, he introduced the classic experiment ba bearing his name, Young's experiment. And what he did is he divided a beam of light into two parts. And nowadays we tend to think of doing this with two small holes. You shine a beam of light on two small holes. Young himself, I believe, used a knife edge just to split a beam in two. And then you look at how those light waves combine on a screen beyond. And Young himself, what he, what he expected and what he showed is that when the light comes out of these very small holes, it spreads out in circular waves. And those circular waves end up interfering, overlapping, interfering with each other. And the up part of one wave can, can join up with the down part of the other wave, creating dark spots. Or the up part of one wave can join with the up part of the other wave, creating bright spots. And so these points C, D, E, and F here are where the two waves are completely out of sync. And you can see, in essence, what look like dark lines here. And that's what Jung was saying is that, and this is his own sketch from roughly 1803, that, that you'll end up with lines of light and dark, and that's entirely due to this phenomenon of wave interference. Now, you can also see this in water waves, and in fact, you can see this in Google Earth, this wonderful paper that came out a few years ago. Researchers said, hey, you can teach wave optics by just looking at water waves through satellite imagery. And here's an example of two apertures in a seawall producing these circular waves. So you can see this phenomenon in any sort of wave experiment. But Young was the first one to demonstrate that, yes, in fact, you can see these bright and dark lines on the measurement screen. As simulated here, you get bright and dark lines. And those bright and dark lines are due to the interference of waves from the two pinholes at A and B. Now, this idea of interference is important, which is why I give you a bit of a history for talking about this idea of super oscillations. And the most challenging part of this talk is introducing a concept of wave decomposition. It turns out that mathematically, if you're looking at a wave at a single frequency or a single color, like a laser beam, you can always mathematically decompose that beam of light into a collection of fundamental building blocks that we call plane waves. And plane waves are basically waves that oscillate only in one direction. And it can be shown that any arbitrary light beam, like a laser beam that's highly directional, can be written as a collection of plane waves, all of which have the same wavelength, but are, which are traveling in different directions. And you can think of any light wave can be written as the interference of a collection of these fundamental plane waves. If you like, the analogy that can be made is that these plane waves act like fundamental Lego blocks. And working with a number of fundamental Lego pieces, you can construct all sorts of complicated structures. Similarly, with these fundamental plane wave blocks, you can construct all sorts of complicated waves. Now, with that plane wave decomposition argument, 
you can make an argument about the resolution of optical systems. Remember that I said we don't expect to see a bright spot much smaller than a half a wavelength. And you can see that argument roughly through this plane wave decomposition. So for a beam that's traveling, say, downward, you can, you can construct that beam with a bunch of plane waves that are all traveling roughly downward, just at slightly different angles. And the most extreme case you can imagine is where you add two plane waves that are basically propagating horizontally, but in opposite directions. And so they'll each oscillate with a wavelength oscillation in the horizontal direction. And when you add them together, you're going to get a standing wave. And that standing wave is going to have bright spots that are basically separated by a half a wavelength. Because in fact, within one wavelength, you have one up spot and one down spot. And so when you add the two, two counter propagating waves together, <clears throat> the two up spots combining produce one bright spot and the two down spots combining produce another bright spot. So two bright spots are separated by a half a wavelength. And this suggests, roughly speaking, this suggests that you shouldn't be able to get a bright spot smaller than a half a wavelength. This in fact turns out to be not quite true. It's a good guideline, but not quite exactly true. But this was a conventional wisdom for many, many years. And in fact, in 1879, Lord Rayleigh, another brilliant optics researcher, set up this sort of rough, rough criteria for the resolution limit in creating an imaging system. And it's based on the wavelength in very much a way that I said. So if you image, for instance, two point-like objects in a telescope, so you're looking at two stars that effectively are point-like sources, well, your imaging system, because it can't produce a spot much smaller than a wavelength, you're going to get two kind of circular disks with a lot of rings around them. And if your two objects are separated far enough apart in the sky, then you'll see two bright smeared out spots. But the closer together the two objects are that you're trying to image, the closer together these two bright spots get. And beyond some critical, some critical threshold, it becomes basically impossible to tell that you've got two spots and it looks like one spot. And Lord Rayleigh came up with this criterion that's based on the diameter of the aperture using for imaging and the wavelength of light, and basically said that the angular resolution of your system depends on the wavelength and that there's roughly a, a, a that there's a limit to how well you can image objects based on the wavelength and the design of your telescope but rayleigh's criterion is really a guideline rayleigh looked at looked at two spots and said at what distance that can i determine can i say that these two spots are no longer distinguishable to the human eye and that's led people to ask, is it possible to get around the limitations of Rayleigh's criteria with specialized optical systems? And in fact, there are a number of systems out there today that can be used to beat Rayleigh's limit, one of which was introduced in 1922 by a researcher named Singe. Singe used a very, Singe proposed using a very tiny aperture that's much smaller than the wavelength of light. And he said, for instance, suppose you send light through this tiny aperture. Well, right at the output of the aperture, the light beam is going to be basically the size of the aperture itself. It'll very rapidly spread out as it propagates away from the aperture. But if you bring this aperture very close to objects or to a surface that you want to image, then the light will only interact in a, over a very small spot on the surface. And you can then measure the light that gets scattered and you'll get a sub-wavelength resolution image. 
and this is an example of such near what we call now near field optics or this technique is called near field scanning optical microscopy because you basically take this tiny probe you bring it really close to a surface you want to image and then you move this probe across the surface to map out what's on the surface and this image shows some work that was done in 2015 where they were able to get this really high resolution image of what we would call a, of a molybdenum disulfide flake. And an ordinary confocal microscope gives you this just blurred out image. So near field optics is a very successful way of doing imaging but it has its fundamental limitations, one of which is you have to get this probe very close to the object in order to do imaging. So you need to have a very sophisticated system that can bring your probe to within a wavelength distance of the things you want to measure. These probes end up being very delicate because we're talking about needles that are smaller than a wavelength in diameter, which means they're smaller than, say, a micron in diameter which means they're tiny and very delicate and break very easily. And also, it turns out that light doesn't like to travel in tiny tubes much smaller than a wavelength. So you get very little light through this tiny tube, which means your system has to be very sensitive to very small light intensities. So near field optics is a very successful technique, but a very specialized one. You can't use it for improving the imaging of just any sort of system. Another example to beat the resolution limit was introduced in the year 2000 by John Pendry, who theoretically demonstrated that if you could construct a material with a negative refractive index, you could create a super lens that would create, in principle, a perfect image. Now, when I say a negative refractive index, Normally, when light goes from one material to another, it bends, its direction changes. When, the, when you're going from one material to another with a positive refractive index, the light bends a little bit, but in a negative refractive index material, it basically does what you might call a right turn. And so if you had a material with a negative refractive index, light rays, if we go back to this ray picture, light going from an object point would get make a right turn in the material, make a, not, make a left turn on the way out, and all of those light rays going from the object will meet at the image point, even though we've got a flat piece of material, we'll in principle get a perfect image on the other side of this slab. Now, Unfortunately, nobody knows yet how to perfectly make such so-called metamaterials, but you can approximate this super lens by using a slab of silver, and people have demonstrated kind of high-resolution imaging using this super lens. But again, you're limited by the fact that the object you want to image has to be very close to your lens. That is, you can't image things very far away, which means that trying to prove the resolution of telescopes can't be done with the super lens or this near field optics technique. So that brings us to the topic of super oscillations. Now, in 1994, the story of super oscillations turns out to be very old. It dates back to the 60s. Um, but it didn't get broad attention until about 1994. And in 1994, um, Professor Michael Berry um, wrote an article dedicated to the work of his colleague, Yakir Aharonov. And Aharonov had noticed and sort of also rediscovered something that other people had found, that you can make, uh, you can create oscillations in a system that are faster than the theoretical limit. And Aharonov had discussed this in the context of quantum mechanics. And in 1994, Barry 
pointed out that how this would work in optics, this idea of super oscillation, the waves that can locally oscillate much faster than the wavelength of light. Now, to give you an idea of what he's talking about, Barry's paper is very mathematical, so I won't dwell on all the mathematical details. But to give you an idea of what he's talking about, here's a picture of a super oscillation that I sort of theoretically constructed. We have, first of all, we imagine a wave that's roughly, roughly a wavelength in size. Actually, it oscillates with a, a, a period a little bigger than a wavelength. And the super oscillation is the solid curve, that between these two peaks, we can see that there's this tiny little bump. And that's a, a spot where, with, whose size is closer to a quarter of a wavelength in size rather than a half wavelength. Remember we said that a half a wavelength is about as small as we typically expect to see a spot. But in this case, we've got a spot that's about half that size. And this is what we mean by a super oscillation, that locally, over a small region of some, some wave, we can create oscillations that, have, that oscillate faster than the wavelength. Or, or we can create oscillations that are arbitrarily close together, creating a region with a wavelength as small as we like. Now the disadvantage of these super oscillations can be seen in this picture as well. You'll notice that you can hardly see this little super oscillation bump and it's surrounded on either side by these huge peaks. And this turns out to be the trade-off with super oscillations. The faster you make your super oscillation and the more you allow it to oscillate, the larger those side regions, which are called side lobes, become compared to the oscillations themselves. And Michael Berry did an excellent calculation of this in his paper. He first quoted um, another researcher, B. Logan, who said, it is possible to design a signal with a band limit of one hertz that would reproduce Beethoven's Ninth Symphony exactly. Well, Barry went and said, okay, if this is possible, how big would those side lobes be? And he argued that, and he calculated that the side lobes would be one billion times larger than the signal itself, which is clearly quite impractical. But it is an intriguing possibility that we can make for instance, we could make a speaker that could not put out frequencies faster than a, we could use a set of speakers, I should say, that could put out n frequencies no faster than one hertz, but that could play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in real time exactly. But in order to do so, it would have to be encoded in a signal where the overall signal would have an amplitude one billion times larger than the symphony itself, which is clearly impractical unless you not only want your eardrums blown out, but want to get killed by the sound wave. But where do these super oscillations come from? How can you have super oscillations in the first place? Well, it turns out to be all about the zeros. Mathematically, one can move the zeros of a wave around without changing the band limit of the wave function. That is, we start with this one hertz signal, and, and it turns out we can take those zeros in that one hertz signal, and we can move them all really close together to make a very rapidly oscillating signal. The trade-off is those locations where we took the zeros away the amplitude in those regions, which no longer have zeros, get really big, so that we end up with those huge side lobes. But to create zeros, though another way you can think of creating zeros is by destructive interference, like Young's interference experiment. If we add together a bunch of different waves with just the right combination, we can create 
complete destructive interference where those zero positions are as close together as we like. And so one way to think about this is that this idea of super oscillations is really a generalization of Young's interference experiment. And when I say a generalization of Young's interference experiment, I say, well, let's not just add together two waves, let's add together multiple waves, and let's have multiple holes in our pinhole screen. And if we put those pinholes in the right locations and we let just the right amount of light come through, we should be able to get super oscillations. We should be able to construct super oscillatory fields. And this all comes back again to a topic that I've talked about many times, which is optical vortices. As soon as you start adding together three or more waves, like in a three pinhole Young's experiment, instead of getting those dark lines on your measurement screen, you get dark points on your measurement screen. And in fact, for three pinholes, you're gonna get this hexagonal pattern. And those points on the screen are lines of darkness in three-dimensional space. And we call those optical vortices. And to explain why we call them an optical vortex, we have to look at the wave behavior again. And we tend to draw, I've been drawing pictures of the up and down of waves as sort of a wiggly line, but that's impractical if you want to describe what the wave is doing at any point in a plane. So instead, I represent the up and down parts of the wave by colors. And that upper, that relative up or down position is what we call the phase of the wave. And so we draw it using colors. And then if you look at a vortex beam where you've got one of these vortices just sort of built into the center of a beam of light, this is what the intensity would look like if you looked at the laser. Well, you find that the phase increases or decreases by an integer number of cycles of the wave. And so the phase goes through a full cycle upward this way or a full cycle downward this way. Or we can have a higher order vortex where the wave does two positive cycles as you go around that central zero or any number of integer cycles. And that basically means that these vortex beams have a twist in them. They have a handedness to them, like a screw. Now, the reason I bring this up is it turns out that super oscillations have, in fact, been hiding in plain sight for years. So in 1974, Michael Berry with his colleague John Nye, Berry again, um, first introduced this idea of singularities and wave fields and optical vortices. But for a long time, people have known that if you take one of these higher order vortex beams and you distort it or perturb it, that, for instance, here I've got a third order vortex. We've got three cycles of the wave as you go around the central point. If I perturb that wave, that, that third order vortex breaks into three first order vortices. But in order to go from three vortices at a single point to three vortices at different points, those vortices had to separate in space in a continuous way. So there was some situation where two of these vortices were arbitrarily close together. And that's exactly what we mean by a super oscillation is a region where two or more zeros are arbitrarily close together. So these super oscillations have in fact been staring us in the face for years, but people hadn't really thought about it in that way. Now, okay, so super oscillations exist. Barry wrote this first paper about super oscillations in optics in 1994. But nobody, had, nobody really did a lot of work on super oscillations for years. And part of the reason for that was nobody really, I think part of the reason for that was nobody could really see what you might do with this. Because of these huge side lobes, it wasn't clear that 
super oscillations could ever be used in a practical sense for imaging. Even though Barry suggested that that might be a possibility, nobody had, not many people really looked at that in, seriously. But after the year 2000 passed, people started to come back to this idea of super oscillations and saying, well, let's try and use it for imaging and see what happens. Well, the first challenge was, how do you make a spot of sub-wavelength size that, are, that is super oscillating? How do you make those spots in the first place? And the first significant experimental attempt I know of took advantage of a phenomenon called the Talbot effect. And the Talbot effect is this observation that goes back over 100 years, that when light passes through a periodic grating, it produces a periodic and very intricate pattern right beyond the grating. So imagine light is coming from the left. We have this periodic grating going in the vertical direction. And in this case, the grating I chose was a collection of apertures, and I did this simulation. And if you look at what happens to the light coming out of these apertures, as it propagates further, you get this very intricate symmetric pattern that's now known as a Talbot carpet, probably for obvious reasons. It looks like a very intricate woven carpet. And that intricate pattern suggests that there are probably a lot of points in here where we could find very rapid oscillations of the field that could be called super oscillations. And some researchers in 2007 decided that the most interesting way to do this in two dimensions, um, so first of all, this grading is a one-dimensional grading. The slits basically point are invariant out of the page. So they're really long slits out of the page. But if you want to see super oscillatory spots, you need a two-dimensional pattern. And so researchers in 2007 realized that they could take advantage of what is called a quasi-crystalline structure. And a quasi-crystalline structure is a structure that has a order to it. It has long-range order. You can predict what's going to happen far away based on what the pattern is nearby, but the structure is not periodic. It never repeats itself. And this is an example of a quasi-crystalline pattern that I put together using these six fundamental building blocks. I did this for a blog post some time ago. And this idea of quasi-crystalline order, I believe, goes back to the work, mathematical work of Roger Penrose, who first put together this sort of tiling pattern. And for reasons that I won't go into in detail here, quasi-crystalline whole arrays turn out to be very good for generating super oscillatory spot patterns. And this is exactly what these researchers did in 2007. They said, okay, we're going to drill a bunch of holes in a plate, basically like a Young's multiple pinhole interferometer, and we're going to arrange those pinholes in this quasi-crystalline pattern. And then they looked at the intensity of light at different distances from this hole pattern, and they did, in fact, find that they got these regions where they got these super oscillatory spots. So if we zoom in on this tiny region, you see a tiny, tiny little spot right in the middle here and here, surrounded by a bright ring. That's that side lobe again. So this was a demonstration that, yes, they could construct experimentally super oscillatory spots. And here they did it by a brute force approach of making an interference pattern that was likely to produce super oscillatory spots and found that, yes, in fact, they found them. But this pattern itself is not going to be too useful for imaging again. If we want to use super oscillations for imaging, we need a single focal spot, just like a lens will focus light to a single spot. We need an optical element that will focus light to a single super oscillatory spot. And that's a bit more challenging. 
But in 2012, a collaborative group just used computational methods to design a lens that could do this. Because it's hard to design super oscillations with a pen and paper technique. So they basically designed an algorithm that solved the problem for them and told them what the shape of their lens had to look like to create a super oscillatory spot. And in fact, they found that they did create this wonderful, very narrow spot with, again, a very bright side lobe around it. And the spot size here is 185 nanometers. I believe that the wavelength used was about 660 nanometers. So they devised a spot that was roughly a quarter of a wavelength. But how do you use this for imaging? Well, this is where the challenge is because you only want to you only want the information from this tiny spot and you don't want information from this side lobe. Well, the first approach these researchers did is they said, we are only going to image objects that are much smaller than this bright ring. So they scanned their super oscillatory spot across, for instance, a set of apertures. And as long as those apertures were much smaller than this ring, the apertures never intersected the ring. And then they could just scan this spot across their apertures and see what came out the other side. So they first looked at just imaging a very tiny slit and they could resolve that slit very nicely. Then they put two slits together, and these two slits are both very narrow and separated by a very narrow distance. And with their super oscillatory spot, they were able to see resolve these two apertures. When a conventional microscopy was used to try and image these apertures, you could not see that there are two apertures. You just saw one big blob. They also went a little further and looked at a collection of random small holes that were very close together. And again, with a conventional microscope, you can't see any, you can't really distinguish these different holes. But with their super oscillatory lens, they were able to see largely the different spots. Obviously, these two in the upper right here were so close together that they couldn't still be easily resolved, but otherwise you get a much better image than you do with a conventional microscope. So that's a big step indicating that, yes, you can, under the right circumstances, image things with a super oscillatory lens. However, that previous technique is not terribly practical. Many, most of the things we want to image are not going to be apertures in an opaque metal plate, for instance. Um, you want to be able to image small structures. And research that was done in 2017 was a great advance because what they showed is that you don't have to illuminate your object with super oscillatory light. You can, you can have an object producing and producing light and impose a super oscillatory pattern on that light and still get the benefits of super oscillations. And this is what they did. They used as an object, they had a laser illuminating some object and the object was various letters of the alphabet. And then that light went through this imaging system and the imaging system, they used what's called a spatial light modulator and the spatial light modulator either was acted just as an ordinary mirror, in which case this whole thing acted as an ordinary imaging system, or they imposed a super oscillatory pattern on this modulator, in which case it becomes a super oscillatory imaging system. And if you used it in an ordinary imaging system mode, then you can't really tell what you're looking at. These tiny, tiny, objects can't be imaged. With the super oscillatory lens, however, they were able to 
more easily identify the letter E and the letter N that they used as their object patterns. And again, you see this bright disk around it, so you can't get away from that side lobe. But you can potentially get better resolution of small objects within a region. So if you're trying to if you're trying to look at the fine details of a very small object, super oscillation will apparently do the trick. Now, there are so many other things I could say about super oscillation. So the field is still relatively new. You'll see a lot of these papers are very new. I should note that you can do super oscillations in time as well. In fact, that's how we started. I started by talking about making super oscillations in a signal in time with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, for instance. And people have demonstrated both theoretically and experimentally that you could take a Gaussian pulse of light in time that has a certain range of freak that consists of a certain range of frequencies. You can impose super oscillations on that Gaussian pulse without changing the frequency components that are included. And that's the idea of super oscillations, making it oscillate faster without adding any additional frequencies to it. So you can end up with this super oscillatory bump in the middle. Now, this adds one other interesting concept that is worth mentioning because it's a lot of fun. If we can introduce a very fast oscillation in a signal that does not contain those frequencies, or to put it another way, if we can impart high frequencies in a low frequency signal, we have the seemingly paradoxical situation where we could, for instance, have a tube filled with red light. We have red light passing down this tube. We open up a window of a very narrow, over a very narrow period of time when the super oscillations are passing, and then we shut the window again. And during that time when the window is open, we could have gamma rays coming out because we could have our super oscillations oscillating at gamma ray frequencies. So we could have a tube filled with red light, open and shut a window and have gamma rays pop out. And you might ask, how is this possible? Well, this is another one of these fun thought experiments. And what it comes down to is that in order to actually isolate and see those x-rays, you would need to open and close the window in this tube very fast. Now, the light, the red light will be interacting with this window the whole time. And when you open and close the window, you're, you're using energy to open and close that tiny window. Now, anytime you're changing a system in time, you're potentially adding energy to the system. And so basically what the result is, is the reason you can get gamma rays out is that when you're opening this window and then slamming it shut again, you, you yourself are providing the energy to convert those red light photons into gamma rays. And for those who know a little bit more physics, it's kind of a Compton scattering type problem that you have a photon colliding with a fast moving particle, in this case, the window you're opening and closing. And so the, some of the energy of that particle can get transferred to that photon to give you those gamma rays. And again, Michael Berry with one of his colleagues, Fishman, um, went through the math of this paradoxical sim, uh, situation and showed how it all works and that it in fact makes sense. And this was again an original idea that was proposed by Aharonov that Barry and Fishman went through to work out the mathematical details. So super oscillations provide some interesting theoretical questions as well as potential practical applications.
And to summarize, a super oscillation is a phenomenon where at least locally, you can have a wave that oscillates faster than any of its constituent components do. And the super oscillations are the result of wave interference that you can always add waves together in just the right way to cause them to have zeros very closely spaced together. Now these super oscillations, however, are always accompanied by very strong side lobes that there's a price to be paid by squeezing those zeros together. When you squeeze those zeros together, you basically make bigger peaks around them. And what we're seeing is that people are starting to use these super oscillations to produce images that beat the traditional resolution criteria of Rayleigh. But these images um, require additional tricks and effort to make them worthwhile and practical. And the field is still new, um, at least in terms of practical application, the theory is still, the, the idea is still new. So I don't want to speculate on the likelihood that they will be used in practice widely, but physicists constantly surprise me with their ingenuity and in turning ideas that seem impractical into practical effects. So don't be surprised if you see these things appear in practical applications in the future. So that's a summary of super oscillations. Let me end by just pointing out that I have my popular science book on the history and science of falling cats, falling felines, and fundamental physics is available. So please check it out if you like the sort of stuff I talk about. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed.